My name is Sarus Farvar. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, welcome uh, everybody here. I should start off by saying that I, if you, if anybody has Googled my name, and uh, you might know that I'm a, I'm a technology journalist. I work with a website called Ars Technica. Anybody read Ars Technica out there? A few people. All right, go check it out if you if you want to. Um, it's really fun to, to be back in Estonia for me. Uh, I'm, I've mentioned this to a few people uh, who know me. Um, I am an Estonia obsessive. Uh, some people have asked me if I'm married to an Estonian. I, I'm not, um, but I'm kind of married to Estonia as a country. Um, my friends in California will tell you that uh, I can talk for hours and hours about how much I love uh, Estonia, and it's true. This is actually my like eighth trip in the last seven years or so. Um, I first kind of fell in love with, uh, with the tech scene and later the country as a whole and have traveled all over the country, Hiuma, Muniste, Narva, uh, all over the place. Uh, so it's, it's great to be back here um, and uh, share this with you. So um, I wanted to make this a little bit more interactive just so that you know we aren't just blathering at you. We have a fair bit of time and there's somebody running around with microphones where is this person? Okay, is that you? Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's this woman here with, with microphones. Um, we're gonna chat a little bit, uh, but I would really like people to ask questions of me, of, of the panel. Uh, we'd really like this to be uh, as, as interactive as possible, uh, just so that you know we can talk to each other, not just so we're talking at you. So uh, if you'd like to contribute, if you'd like to interject, uh, please raise your hand, and uh, our, our friend over here in the back will um, come find you and pass you a mic. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I'll just start off with, with Andrew. Andrew, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Hi. So, my name is uh, Andrew Scott. Um, I'm based in London and Silicon Valley, um, and I'm a startup entrepreneur in mobile and online. Um, I've, had, uh, I've just started my sixth company, um, and before that, I had one exit, three fails, and one to be decided which I'm still on the board of, so. All right, so. Eric. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, my name is Eric Sufert. I'm based in Helsinki. I'm the uh, head of marketing and user acquisition at a uh, mobile games company called Gray Area. Our last game uh, was called Shadow Cities. Uh, it was kind of a genre-defining game based around uh, location, and uh, our next game should be coming out before the end of the year. And Raul. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Raul Jervis, and I'm from Estonia. And um, I'm uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, TaxiPal. And uh, TaxiPal helps people to find trusted taxi services uh, in different countries. Currently, our uh, service covers uh, 31 countries, and uh, uh, it's available in 10, 10 different languages. All right. So we're here to talk about um, mobile, we'll talk about uh, apps, uh, to talk about kind of mobile startups, things like that. How many people here in the room, I'm going to guess that pretty much all the hands are going to go up, but I'm going to do this anyway. How many people in the room own a smartphone? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many people uh, have friends who aren't in the tech community, your parents, your grandparents, your weird uncle who lives in Viljandi? Um, who, I got to laugh. All right, that's good. Um, <laughs> how many how, of those people, your non-tech friends? How many would you say? Uh, like, would you say the mo if the majority of them own a smartphone? Raise your hand. Okay, so half. Okay, that's interesting. Um, one last question: of the people who do own smartphones, again, your non-tech friends, would you say the majority of them uh, frequently are installing new apps on their phone? Even less. Okay, so I think that speaks to uh, Andrew and I were talking before this. Uh, Andrew uh, wrote a, a column for a very cool new um, online magazine called The Colonel that's being published out of London. Um, you should go check it out if you get a chance. Um, but he wrote an article that I wanted to get uh, our colleagues here to, to react to, which was this idea of keeping mobile apps simple. Uh, I think if I, if I am summarizing it accurately, he was talking about how there's way too many apps that do way too many things and they're difficult for even tech people to use and impossible to use for uh, our friends who maybe aren't as, as, as tech savvy. Uh, so I wanted to get Andrew if he could just comment a little bit on 
why does this problem exist? Like, why are these apps so complicated? And can you give a, kind of a good example of something that you think is kind of over-engineered? Okay, so <clears throat> I wrote the article because I spent the last year uh, in between companies talking to a lot of, uh, trying to mentor a lot of startups. Um, and I think one of the challenges if you're doing anything on mobile today is that you know, how you use your mobile, if you're a, uh, an entrepreneur or a tech entrepreneur, is probably not how the average person uses their mobile. Um, if you look at the percentage of people that have mobiles um, as part of population in the UK and the US, um, depending on which statistics you believe, it's probably only about 35-40% of people have a smartphone. Um, and if you compare that to the internet, um, you'd have to go way back to about 2003, um, 2002 to be about at the same percentage. So in terms of um, the way that people are using their mobiles, um, out of that 30 or 40 percent, um, the st statistics say that only 50 percent have actually installed uh, an app. Um, so there's a, there's a gap between people getting a smartphone to start with, but then if you, even if you own a smartphone, there's a gap between how you use it and the capabilities of that phone. So if you're a startup entrepreneur and you want a, you know, you want a successful company now with an app that is going to be installed by millions of people, um, my belief is you need to keep that app very simple. Eric, do you, uh, as somebody who kind of works in, in the field, working in gaming specifically, um, we were talking earlier, there, there's a reference to Rovio. Um, uh, I don't know if you consider them a competitor or not, but um, would you say, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that's attractive about, about Angry Birds, Rovio, of course, I think most people know is the company that made the, the Angry Birds game. How many people have Angry Birds on their phone? Okay, everybody. Wow. <laughs> um, I do. So yeah, I think one of the things that's, that's fun about Angry Birds is that I think it fits this sort of paradigm, which is that it's extremely simple to use. Anybody who's shown Angry Birds for the first time can be taught how to play it in five seconds. Um, so I'm wondering, how, how does that kind of this idea of simplicity go into game design? Yeah, I, I would agree 100% um, with what Andrew said. Um, you know, you sh your, your app should do one thing really, really well. Um, the thing about Angry Birds, um, you know, in their first year, they had 50 million downloads, uh, you know, but, but they launched to an app store in, uh, you know, 2009 that is a very different place uh, than the app store you'd be launching to today. Uh, the app store today is cluttered with tons of free apps, and theirs was paid. I mean, that was their only monetization channel was the paid app. Um, and the original Angry Birds included no viral mechanic. I mean, it spread purely through word of mouth. So, I mean... If they had cluttered it up with a bunch of different sort of um, you know gameplay features or sort of like gameplay uh, loops, I don't think it would have taken off. It was just that very simple gameplay mechanic that made it really addictive um, and something that brought you know sort of the Dao Mao to like such a high level, um, you know that that people would be playing it you know uh, you know three four times a week um, and something that you know something that you're playing so often is something that you're going to tell your friends about. But yeah, they, they kept it extremely simple and it was a very streamlined gameplay mechanic. Yeah. Raul, as somebody who, who works on, on kind of the more utilitarian side of things with, with TaxiPal, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that fits into these types of services, apps that, that people use on their phones to, you know, not play a game, but to, to achieve some objective in, in your case, uh, finding taxis? Um, I think it's uh, the very... Very same is true also for that kind of apps, uh, meaning the usability and uh, simplicity are uh, quite important. Uh, and I have to admit, uh, when we started uh, with four tech guys, we uh, pretty much over-engineered our first version as well. I know we have this, all those great ideas what we could do with the app and all can, this. Can you, explain, like, can you give me some more detail about that? How, how, how did that? What did that look like that you took away? Uh, well, basically, for example, we have, uh, because we have access to uh, NAPTEC global database of the local uh, points of interest and uh, addresses, so we thought that it would be great also to uh, include a functionality that you could, uh, you know, search for places like points of interest, hotels, restaurants, uh, around your vicinity when you travel. You know, well, yes, it's doable, uh, and there are other apps that do it, but uh, would it be a uh, necessary thing to have in a taxi ordering app? Maybe not. Uh, so we, uh, we took it out. And uh, so it was basically you know, quite typical thing that you know, with the tech guys creating an app that oh, we could do all those cool things. Although we still left a lot out uh, for version 2, 
uh, which for fortunately never uh, ha <laughs> happened. We, we kind of came to our senses before that. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is that uh, uh, adding all those things into the app uh, has uh, several drawbacks. Uh, one is that, uh, yes, it makes it uh, very complex for the average user. Um, although, you know, for, for the tech guy, it's like, you know, hey, it's so simple, how, can I, how, how, do, how don't you understand it? Uh, but uh, yeah, some user studies we did uh, showed that, yes, it, it was too complex, as well as um, some of the uh, functionality uh, was not available everywhere. Uh, so uh, it also raised the expectations uh, from the end users, from the people who downloaded it. And then when they downloaded it and they found that uh, they couldn't use some feature in that area where they were, were located, then it was like a disappointment. So it's also the expectancy management or, or kind of, uh, mm -hmm. not, to, not to promise uh, more than you can deliver at every, every location. You want no, to add to me? Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that I think it's an in incredibly important point, um, not just for mobile apps, but as you said, online as well, the usability. And the temptation is, you, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you're building this thing. It's like, oh, we could do this and it's so cool. But um, if you don't focus on, on doing that one thing really well, then it confuses users as to where you fit in their life. Like this person has, they, they have all their attention taken up by, you know, 60% Facebook and then, you know, a bunch of other things that they, the other five apps they use on their phone. And they need to understand you know, where, in your, where in their lives you fit and why they should dedicate time every day or every week to using your app. Um, and if you confuse that message by adding functionality that's not, that doesn't solve that core problem you're trying to solve, um, I think that, that causes a, a great problem. And it also makes your own job harder. Like you said, when it comes to you know, measuring user flows and, and A-B testing and multivariance testing and trying to understand where in that path the user is, is falling down, um, if you don't have, if you have more than one, if you have many, many use cases, then you know, you're never going to get to the bottom of, of optimizing one use case because it's actually a really hard process. How many mobile uh, app developers are in the room right now? If you are actively working on a mobile app or part of a company, only a few people. One, maybe, two... Maybe we should, we should switch the topic of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> How many people... do? You, if you, do you guys feel like, like your, the mobile apps that you do use, do you feel like, are you, are you generally happy with them? Do you feel like they're, they're over-engineered? Do you, you know, what do you wish that, that people are, are, are working on? What, what would you guys like to know from, from people who, who have experience in this? If, I, if there are any questions, this is, I'm opening it up to questions right now. No questions are in the room? Nice. Yes, okay. Mike, moving across. Good deal. Just quickly, while, while she's walking over, how many people are developing an app or a service, not mobile, but web? So who's an entrepreneur here developing something? A few more. OK. And how many people are VC or investment? OK. okay. How many students? OK. So we've still got 20 30% missing. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many journalists? <laughs> Three. OK. All right. Thanks. Because it's a good idea. Uh, I can hear you. I don't know if the mic can hear you. Is it on? <laughs> yes? No? Just shout. How many technologists does it take to turn on the microphone? There we go. Okay, this one. Okay, okay. there we go. Great, super. Okay, um, uh, during the last like five years or so. Because can you I'm introduce yourself? What's your name? And uh, I'm sorry, I'm Ryder. Uh, most of you should know me anyway, but uh, I'm from the foundation, <laughs> Dana Palomar, the organizers as well. But the whole thing with the last five years is that, uh, and now with Instagram and all of that, that you have applications and mobile applications that I like to call muffin apps. It means that they don't do basically anything anymore. So it means that in a way, you're saying that sometimes you're over-engineering uh, stuff, right? That's totally true as well, but it seems to be that, you know, with stripping things away and away and away, you have stuff that and applications that are basically just showing where's the closest muffin store. And it's kind of getting ridiculous. <laughs> did you, sorry, did you say muffin? Yes, I did. <laughs> just, just checking. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, you guys, don't you think that there's also kind of a thin line, or maybe not too thin, actually, where you just go too far with the simplicity and you start doing apps that are actually worth scrap? I can, I can tell you. That was a starter. Um, uh, you know, I, I kind of hear your frustration. Um, but my argument would be that it's important you have a bigger vision. Yeah, if you're a startup entrepreneur, 
you don't want just to be a feature. So I think it's important to have a, have a bigger vision out there. But many entrepreneurs, I find, um, try and head straight towards that vision and, and don't work out what their go-to-market strategy is. Like, how do you get your first 100 users, 1,000 users, 100,000, 1 million, you know, before, so that, so that you have something on which to build, both to get investment, um, but also so that you can help your users teach you about whether your vision is actually, you know, whether your, your trajectory towards your vision is actually the right direction. Um, and so, yeah, some, you know, a fart app, I mean, personally, that doesn't excite me, but um, so, so I, sh I share some of your um, frustrations. But things, when, when you're looking at things like Instagram, which was obviously bought by Facebook for, for zillions of dollars, um, that's building off an existing user behavior, um, which people do in their lives already, and adding some value over the top um, for people. And so if you can identify a behavior that already exists and add some value and then help educate your users as you grow into those more advanced features, then um, you have a better chance of success. I mean, even the big services like Facebook started this, right? When, when Facebook started originally really as a way to find out, you know, who your friend is shagging at college or, you know, you know that cute girl you saw in the science class, like a way to sort of flirt with her or poke her or whatever. You know, so, so it started around something, you know, solving a simple problem for students to get laid, frankly, <laughs> and, and then built from there. You know, if it started out, I mean, I, I made this mistake in 2002. I did a location-based mobile social network in 2002. And you could SMS, you could text in your, like, postcode or zip code, and it sent you back texts of who was nearby. But nobody had any idea what's, what we were trying to do. Like, I said, oh, it's a, it's a location-based social network. And people said, what's a social network? Right? So we were trying to do something that I thought was cool and some of my geeky friends thought was cool, but no one else had any idea. If we'd started off with a much simpler message, and then built on that, maybe we'd have got a bit further. But um, so yeah, I don't know what. Eric, in, in gaming, how, how do you know? I get. I mean, it sounds like the question is, how do you know when you've gone too far? Uh, is is kind of the question. I mean, in terms of working on your own in, in the gaming world, like how do you, you know, uh, can you think of a time when when uh, you know you you guys are working on it and you felt like you missed the mark? I guess. Or? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, you know, if your app is. I, you know, you, you always start with a pain point, right? And then, you know, you're dedicating your time to building some service or product that's going to relieve that pain. Um, so if the pain exists, then whatever you're doing to relieve it will be, you know, real. Um, I guess I would disagree that Instagram doesn't do anything. I mean, the pain point that I had on my mobile device was I have no way to very easily uh, beautify and share my photos uh, with other users on mobile. And they solved that pain point. I mean, I can very quickly take a photo, make it look cool, and share it. And my friends. Yeah, so that's a layer of value over an existing behavior. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. So I mean, I. I mean, I guess you know, the way you'd find out if your app wasn't relieving some pain was that you know you'd test it, and people wouldn't know what it was doing. You know, what, what the point of it was. Yeah. But just wanted to comment on about the muffin apps. Is that uh, actually what it? Uh, uh, does is uh, it also creates a lot of noise in the app stores. Uh, I mean, uh, almost in any any area or uh, functionality of the app you're looking for, you get like hundreds and hundreds of replies. Uh, I mean, that for example, for us uh, happens when you know in the taxi space. Like, I mean, uh, almost every startup competition has a taxi app, and uh, and there are also some uh, extremely local taxi apps that were up to date at the moment they were released and they never touched again. So, but uh, what happens is that uh, in the App Store, uh, it, all this stuff kind of remains there. Uh, and uh, if somebody uh, searches for, for, uh, for good stuff uh, but doesn't know the name, uh, they, will ne they might never find it because the, there's this just piles of piles of those muffin apps uh, uh, in the same category. And uh, and uh, it's just kind of con really it becomes very hard to become visible uh, to the end user. Is this an industry term that is commonly known in this part of the world? Muffin app. I think I think you might have just no. invented a no. new term. Did, right did you? The muffin app. I'm going to okay. start using that. In my uh, next, this is going to start blog. trending on Twitter. We're going to see in this blown Co up. Okay. Uh, muffin app. Interesting. Okay. Just, just to pick up people, like your point. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the problem of. I mean, that's not so much the fault of app developers in that. You know, you can put up a crap website on the internet, and you know, if you don't update it, then it's not going to come up in Google. I mean, the problem there is that Apple and and Android and the stores have done a really shit job of actually 
sensibly rating and managing app discovery, right? I mean, it's an ongoing problem. Well, Go Google Play's a little bit better because you can optimize your, um, you can optimize the um, information that you upload with your, uh, your, your sort of page. But I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like on, on uh, iOS App Store, you know, it, it sorts by number of downloads, right? So if you've had significant traction, which you would have bought with a budget, which would have come from, you know, having been seen as a credible venture from, you know, some investors, then I think, you know, the, you know, the high quality apps rise to the top. It, it can cause a problem for, for indie guys who are starting out with no budget, um, but then you just have to get creative. I'm not sure investors are always the best, best measure of whether something's a, a great product either. Oh, I mean, it's not the best, but I mean, it's, it's one, right? I mean, it's like yeah, a, no, I it's one that you can sort of measure. And yeah. I mean, I don't understand why actually apps don't come up in your search results on the web. I've never understood that. If you type something in, why, why did you not have a section you know, on the right-hand side or something on Google where you've got a list of apps for all the different platforms? I just don't understand that. It seems the most obvious thing in the world. That's a good question. Anybody working at Google in the room? No? All right, well, tell, tell your Google well, friends. I know the director of Bing, so maybe I should well, suggest there you go. to him so as you, a... So you can make it happen. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> Very good. Um, has anybody experienced, uh, I, think, I think, you know, for myself, I've, I have lived uh, most recently, I just finished living two years in Germany, um, but now I've moved back to my home state, California, in, in the United States. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is kind of a, a, a difference in terms of what apps are even available in different parts of the world. Um, that, you know, some apps are only available in certain app stores. I, I, I own an iPhone, so I, don't, I can't speak for Android. Perhaps other people might know better. Um, in terms of geographic restrictions, you know, I know that there's the, you know, Estonia uh, uh, iTunes store in Germany and, and other countries. And so I wonder, is this, is this kind of another issue? Is, is that in terms of what is even out there? What options you have as, as just a consumer? Well, it, ma it makes sense to, you know, limit the geographic reach of your app um, on iOS because reviews are persistent. And, you know, you might get some guy downloading your app that's not localized for his location, and he'll just give it a, you know, one star and say, this app sucks, doesn't work. Um, you know, and, and it's tough. Localizing is expensive. But that goes back to the problem that why rate an app just purely on a star? I mean, if I visit a website and it's an Estonian website and it's in the wrong language or it doesn't support me, I just go, oh, okay, so it's an Estonian website, and then I leave again. Why, why should an app get penalized you know, on its rating just because, you know, it's not, I mean, it just doesn't, it should be my choice. If I want to download an app that is for another country, why can't I download and install that app? I, you know. No, you, you can't, I mean, you're, you're a reasonable person. I mean, <laughs> I, most reasonable there, there people. There are lots of people who wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> yeah, most reasonable people would say, okay, this obviously wasn't meant for me, and I'll just wait until, yeah. you know, my version comes out and leave it at that. Some people get, you know, belligerent. No, I definitely had that problem. I mean, my, my, my last company we, it was a consumer app and eventually we pivoted to, to B2B. But before we, we used to get all sorts of crazy, like terrible one-star reviews because yeah. someone was just being, like they, they, you know, we had Facebook connect t to log in. And they said, ah, oh, it asked me for my Facebook details. And then like one star, crap app, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, you wouldn't go to a website and rate it badly just because you just choose not to sign up. So that's what I mean. I, think, I just think the whole premise of the way that the app stores manage discovery is just, it's just flawed because for, the, for that precise reason. Yep. Mm -hmm. um. Raul, you want to? Uh, well, I basically agree that, uh, I mean, one, one thing is, of course, the uh, localization and uh, the different approach on, uh, taken by uh, different app stores. Uh, but, uh, but, for example, uh, what, what we found is that uh, translating it into the local language of the, of the for example, I don't know, Sweden or Norway uh, also helps to uh, kind of raise there with the number of downloads. But, I mean, if you try to make something global or, like, I mean, even region like Europe-wide, it becomes very, very expensive uh, for a small startup. Yeah, I mean, if, we, if you have a... Uh, big, uh, big, thick uh, wallet from a VC, then you know, great, you know, kind of just spend money on localization and also do some marketing campaigns and uh, get, get to the top and then it's basically like a snowball effect. But if you, if you start up with a you know, small, small budget, uh, like basically from angel, angel funding um, or founders money, then it's uh, you know, pretty difficult to kind of do something outside of your own home market. Uh, because it's just, uh, you know, you, you, don't, you don't get the visibility. Yeah. And unless you get coverage from, uh, like, media by uh, lucky chance, then, you know, you're pretty much screwed. 
And yeah. the answer, sorry, go on. I would say that's the biggest problem with the app stores too, is, is if you don't have a huge budget, it's almost impossible to get to the, uh, to the top rankings. I mean, the number I've been hearing uh, for, you know, um, media blast spending to get your app from launch to top 25 is $300,000. I mean, that's what you need to spend to acquire the number of downloads to get, to get there. And, you know, the Zingas and, uh, you know, Grease and, uh, you know, Rovios have that money. But indie developers and, you know, app developers who are, you know, just launching something that, you know, solves some pain point but haven't gotten funding, um, you know, just simply can't do it. So they have to, you know, resort to other, you know, creative measures, uh, build up a buzz, um, you know, on the Internet or build something that's so sticky that people use it every single day, multiple times a day. And, you know, as a result of that, tell their friends about it. For the Estonians in the room, how many people are using more Estonian language apps than non-Estonian language apps. If you are in that category, raise your hand, that you are using more Estonian language apps than non-Estonian apps. Really? One person. <laughs> One person. What, what apps are you using that, that aren't available, that are only available in Estonia? I would, I'm just curious. There's a mic coming to you. One second. Wait five seconds. Parking. Parking, parking and banking. Parking and what? Bank. Banking. Okay, that's interesting. So yeah, so that's very specific, uh, very, very locally specific. That's interesting. Um, all right, yeah, there was a question up here. Sorry, one second. Can we have the microphone coming to you? All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Toby Moore as a venture investor. Um, thanks for the comments on marketing. We, we receive a lot of people with their, um, their wonderful projects, mobile or, or uh, web, saying they're, uh, they're going to build it and then uh, they'll spread it through viral marketing. And we just haven't seen it. And we, we believe that you really need a lot of money to, to um, make some noise in the, cr in the crowd because it's very crowded. Um, and so that was, that was our opinion. So uh, uh, thanks for confirming that. Because I, I, I just haven't seen any, any real cases where viral marketing on no budget actually works. I, th I mean, I think it... it can if the, a lot of the problem is that like with um, startups online sometimes the products just aren't as good as the entrepreneur thinks they are so and, and the danger is you know quite often I, I talk to entrepreneurs and they say you know okay so you're going to go and ask for this money or when you when you come to ask for your VC round in in six months time after you've got this angel money what, what are you going to spend it on and still probably well too many of them come back and say marketing which is you know a, a, a terrible answer because they think that, you know, oh, if only I had this big budget of marketing, then people would use my app. And um, they'd get installs, but then people would just stop using it. So I think it's very, it's very dangerous for an early stage entrepreneur to, to, to say, well, I can't get downloads and I can't get usage because, you know, I just don't have the budget to do it. I think if you're coming to me and saying, well, I'm only getting 10 downloads a day, but of those 10 downloads, six people are using it, you know, continually for the next, you know, three months, and that's slowly growing, and my, you know, 50% of people that install it are continuing to use it, then you probably have an argument that, yes, marketing would help, but quite often it's that actually they haven't, even with the small groups of people, they haven't, um, they don't really have the metrics for usage, let alone the total user downloads. And most investors, you know, they don't, certainly early stage investors, including VCs, aren't looking for huge numbers in total. They're looking for engagement. Um, so if you go and say, well, we've only got 1,000 users and we've been going for five months, but, you know, 900 of them use our app, then that's a great investment opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, you know, uh, unless you've got proven metrics that show that, you know, your you know, retention rates lead to, like, um, you know, an LCV of some number that's greater than, you know, your, your, your average CPA on a, a mobile network, um, you know, you can't really say that marketing is going to do anything. Uh, I would say 1,000 is a little bit low for me. I would say I would, I'd want to see 10,000 yeah. users in an so app to get, some, to, to get like some actionable insight on the metrics. Um, but, you know, if, if, you, if you're looking for marketing money before you've actually proven the metrics, um, you know, and for games, you'd want to see like, um, you know, 50% day one retention, uh, 50, 25, 13, uh, day 30. Um, you know, then there's, there's no reason to even put money into marketing because you don't know, you, you could be flushing it down the toilet. I mean, people might not retain, they might not monetize. Um, I totally agree about the uh, metrics part is that, uh, I mean, for example, uh, 
you know, downloads are nice. Uh, it just kind of you kind of you can kind of hype them up and uh, and uh, get a huge number of downloads. But at the end, what matters is how many actually use your app. And uh, for example, in our case, uh, when we had uh, some good media coverage in Estonia uh, last year, uh, from there we got some like, steady user base who keep using it, uh, us like regularly. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, even even uh, without doing the viral marketing, which which is like a buzzword, uh, doing a uh, uh, some PR and not like a it's just uh, straight for, through advertising, but uh, it's just like a really, really well-planned PR that can get you like users and, and regular users, and, uh, and that's that's what matters at the end. If you have the users and people keep using it, uh, even if you don't spend any money on them anymore. Uh, well, just to bring things back a little bit, uh, the title of this panel has has Rovio. We talked about Angry Birds. <laughs> Uh, there was a question that came in, believe it or not, from, from our good friends down in Riga in Latvia that came over on Twitter from Andres Berzins. I don't know if he's watching online. Uh, but he wrote to me to say, is Rovio a fluke? And should others learn that game after game after game is the key to success? I think to me that uh, this also drives the point and the larger question uh, about a game like Angry Birds that has kind of become more marketing, more merchandising than a, than a game, you know? And... That's certainly a one way to make money, uh, but you know, uh, if you're a gaming company, I don't know if that's a replicable, replicable, is that a word? Replicatable. Replicatable, uh, <laughs> um, a repeatable uh, model. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, is there a, a balance between, um, I mean, is it just kind of, in, in that case, it seems like they have made the decision that they just want to make money by selling their, you know, character-based kind of, character licensing and... and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, Rovio clearly has aspirations of becoming an entertainment company. Um, but I think what Rovio did that was brilliant was, you know, Rovio was a team of like 65 people. Um, they had produced something like 55 games and they were all flops. The Rovio, the Rovio team that produced Angry Birds uh, had been whittled down to 12 people. And I mean, they were on their last legs. I don't think if, I think if Angry Birds hadn't, hadn't worked, they maybe had money in the bank to do one more game, and that was it. Yeah. But what, what they did that was brilliant was they recognized that gaming is a hits-based business. So when you have a hit, milk it for everything that it's worth. And they, you know, they could have just as easily moved on to their next IP after uh, Angry Birds Space or whatever, or you know, even before that. Um, but they didn't. They, they are continuing to make tons of money on the plush toys and the drinks and the TV shows and stuff. And that's what boosted them into the stratosphere to, you know, a $6 billion valuation. You know, they would have probably been a $100 million company if they had just moved on to the next IP. But now they're, a, you know, a multi-billion dollar company. And that's true of, uh, you know, the same thing's happening with Mosher Monsters, which is a, a, a mind candy in the UK, London-based company. And, and, you know, their Mosher Monsters social network for kids um, had the same sort of, started having great growth. Um, but then he's taking it into the brand space and taking it into, you know, offline um, there's, there was a Moshi, I flew back from San Francisco last week and there was a Moshi Monsters channel on the Virgin Atlantic, um, like music channel, it was pretty bizarre on, 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 the, uh, on the audio on the, on the plane. Well, yeah, um, it's, it's so. weird to me to walk around like, you know, just shopping malls in, in California. I don't know in, out here, uh, but I would presume so, given that Finland is so close. But I, I see tons of Angry Birds, like iPhone cases and toys and uh, hats and all kinds of things. Um, I mean, I guess it's summertime now, so the hats have kind of gone away, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that that, that that seems to me to be, like you said, I guess given that gaming is sort of a, you know, you're only as good as your last game, and if you can have a one-hit wonder and make a lot of money from it, then why not, I suppose, but yeah. Any other questions um, for our esteemed colleagues here? Yes, right here. Yeah, it's a quick question. Um, native web apps, mobile native web apps, or uh, iOS and you know native OS apps. Where do you see the future? And could an app like TaxiPal be developed purely on HTML5 and mobile web? Uh, with a given uh, technology, yes. Although it depends on what platforms you target. Uh, uh, as uh, we also uh, support uh, many Nokia platforms. Uh, then the, the web app experience is not as, not as good yet. Um, but it, but it, uh, it depends on uh, the functionality. 
Um, there, for simple things, uh, web apps are, do, do it very well. And uh, HTML5 uh, you know, gives you a lot of opportunities to do very, very fancy stuff. But still, uh, for any kind of uh, more complex uh, functionality, native still beats the HTML5 or web app. And of course, for example, uh, uh, if there is some kind of uh, more uh, uh, computation intensive stuff or things like that, then, uh, then native also would be, uh, would be still better. Yeah, I, I never really understand this, this whole web OS or thing argument. It always pisses me off at conferences when you have a panel about it because it just seems like a dumb, dumb argument because look at PCs and desktop PCs, you know, what, 20 years? I don't know. And you still have native installed apps. My Dropbox has a native, you know, a native service installed, whatever, you know, TweetDeck was a native service and then a whole bunch of other stuff's in the cloud. And, you know, one of the biggest problems with mobiles is connectivity is still crap, right? And so even on desktop where you have fixed line ADSL and, and stuff and broadband where it's pretty good now, you still have a requirement for something installed locally, even if it's an extension that's installed locally as part of the browser to cache stuff locally and handle that and do that stuff. So I, I agree completely that it's, that it's depends on, on the functionality. Um, ultimately, I'm sure everything will be cloud, but I think we're a long way away. Um, and it's also a big distraction for, for startups. Again, if you're doing, um, if you're an app developer doing a startup, I'd, I'd really recommend you, you focus on doing one platform and get that right and worry about the other platforms later. You know, my last company, we made the mistake of seeing all these, you know, all these handsets being sold and thinking if we could just get access to those, all those people um, and we were trying to support, you know, four or five different platforms. Um, it was a disaster. And the same is true now, of course, with HTML5 on browsers. There are some browser quirks for HTML5. If you're a startup and you're building something in HTML5, just get it working on one browser and, you know, then take it to an investor and say, look, we've got it working on here. We need more money to fix it on all the other browsers, etc." So. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, like, everyone wants to move away from native apps. I mean, native apps are a huge pain, especially when you are doing, uh, you know, cross-platform. Um, iOS is pretty straightforward, but when you're doing Android development, I mean, it is just so expensive to QA all those devices. I mean, doing Android development is basically the same as doing feature phone development, like, five years ago. I mean, you, you basically have to track down some, like, really old, you know, one-off, like, flop devices, make sure it works on there, because... If you don't get it working on, you know, something like 98% of Android devices, Google will never feature you. Um, and that's the only way to monetize on an Android. I mean, if you just push a, an Android app out, um, you know, that works really well on the high-end phones, thinking, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, appeal to the sort of iPhone type Android consumers, you're never going to get it into anybody's handset. I mean, the only way to make money is to get onto the um, Google featuring. Uh, the only thing, yeah, HTML5 has got a lot of issues now, and, you know, any sort of asset-intensive app is going to be really tough to run. Um, but yeah, I think if I was like a startup doing HTML5 gaming, um, I would just do HTML5 gaming on like one browser, get it working really well, have like a, a really, you know, strong proof of concept and then try to get funding and, and, you know, push it out to every browser. That's a nightmare about Android as well, because that is probably going to become the, the default platform. And I think, I think I saw that uh, since the last first three years after launch, um, Android's had four times as much now traction as iPhone since yeah, but three years since the launch. It, so it's like... You know. Android growth numbers just decreased uh, for only the second time ever in the U.S. I mean, I feel like penetration has, has reached its peak. At the same time, you know, as a developer, I mean, like, developing for Android is such a pain in the neck, and you don't monetize. So it's like you, you can really work, you know, you know, bust your hump to try to make a game that Google will feature and cover every, every uh, handset. Uh, and, and then if you get featuring, sure, you'll make tons of money, but only for, like, three weeks. And, you know, if your app... Uh, you know, doesn't retain, doesn't monetize, well, the, the three weeks, you know, sure, it'll be great income for, you know, for the time being, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's not going to sustain a company. Um, it, it's just, for, I mean, I think, you know, you see the Android numbers go, like the Mary Meeker presentation that she released, I think it was last week, you saw the Android is huge now, but uh, I'm just not, I'm not convinced that now is the time to be, to be moving towards it. I mean, you know, you've seen a lot of people do that and take that bet and just fail. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big gamble. I just don't see the monetization on Android yet. I think if you're doing a, if you're a startup, definitely I'd still go iOS, just mainly for the reasons you said. It's easier to develop for, um, but also just because most of the investors have iPhones. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> That's a good point. It, look, it looks kind of shinier, and you know it's guaranteed to work a bit better. Sorry, Question up front, right here. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question about uh, LTE and 4G. Um, Europe was very successful in the introduction of GSM, led the world in it. 
and um, in true European style, we've managed to successfully screw up uh, 4G rollout. Um, the UK hasn't even had the auction. More people join Verizon in a week than actually in the entire uh, 4G rollout. How important do you think 4G will be to the mobile development? Is that, you know, the lack, I mean, you're hinting at the lack of a network. This has always been the problem. Do you see that's going to be a transformative technology or is it going to be simply uh, incremental? Uh, if it delivers, it might be transformative, especially as it may tie in with a sort of tipping point on uh, critical mass on smartphone ownership, um, you know, two to three years down the, down the road. Um, but anyway, it really has to work, right? 3G's never worked like it was meant to or like as it was promised to. Um, I have little faith 4G will. Um, I just, you know, the infrastructure costs are, are vast. And I mean, I think it's the, 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 the elephant in the room, personally, about, you know, mobile is that, you know, connectivity on my mobile is still crap in many cities and places it shouldn't be. And, it, you know, it's a nightmare. So I think it's, I think we've got a, a long, painful journey um, before we have sort of seamless, fast connectivity. I don't know what yeah, you guys I, think. I would agree with that. Uh, I mean, uh, quite often I, I see my phone be using edge. Although, you know, it has a 3G and all this stuff, but it's just, you know, uh, the, the promise is nice, but uh, if they can really deliver it, uh, then that's a question. Well, yes, but they won't, so no. <laughs> 5G's got my vote. I guess I wonder, and I, want, I don't know if, if, uh, if this is what you're driving at, uh, but, but it seems to me that, that, you know, if your app is designed well, I mean, depending on what it does, if it's a game that requires a lot of bandwidth or, or whatever, but versus an app like TaxiPal, for example, uh, that, you know, would work, you know, reasonably well over a slower connection, maybe that, that comes down to how well the app itself is designed, knowing that you're not going to have uh, super high-speed 4G all the time. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's true, but then a lot of the more interesting uses to get, you know, away from the, 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 uh, the muffin apps <laughs> um, uh, rec you know, require you know more data to be transferred. They require usage when perhaps you, you know if they suddenly become very um, they become unreliable if you can't guarantee that you're going to have connectivity. So my um, my last company, Rumble, we originally it was a recommendation um, site, so it's, and you could you could sort of tag places you like. So if I land in a new place and I'm relying on that to get you know, either nav navigate to somewhere or get recommendations from nearby, and then suddenly the data doesn't work for some reason because I'm roaming on a carrier that hasn't got a proper data agreement or it doesn't work, which has happened to me. You know, and the same with Google Maps. I, I use Google Maps all the time, but now if I land in a city and sometimes, every so often, one in five times I hit a country and I'm on a network for some reason the data's not working, I'm, I'm, I'm fucked. I mean, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm sort of... What do I do when I don't have a Google Maps? Oh, I have to ask someone. Or I have to go and find a, go and find a shop that sells a map. You know, and it's so frustrating. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I have more faith in you know, consumers uh, beginning to demand uh, basically from you know, every retail outlet that they provide Wi-Fi, like here in Estonia. I mean, like, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I turn my, um, my data connection off when I come over, but I never need it because there's always Wi-Fi everywhere. So I, mean, I, I have more faith in that happening. Um, you know, then some like seamless 4G rollout. Any other questions? There's still hope. Right here. <laughs> Wait for it. Hey, I'm uh, Juri with Talent Tag and Garage 48. Any feelings on the adoption of mobile in enterprise and for B2B apps and uh, related to that, uh, you hear quite a lot about, uh, especially in the US, uh, building mobile first or mobile only. How do you believe that applies actually to the enterprise and B2B apps, not, uh, not the consumer apps? Mobile and enterprise, that's not an area that I know anything about. <laughs> I, I can only speak anecdotally. Uh, my, the first company I worked for was a startup called Uship, and uh, I was their uh, transportation marketplace based out of Austin, Texas. And I was just in Austin uh, two, last week or two weeks ago, and I went and visited. And they said that more people use the site on mobile now than do on web. Um, it's something like 60/40, and you know, it's it's uh, in, in in terms of usage, it's growing uh, by a couple percent a month. So I, I think uh, enterprise apps can work fine. And I mean, it's, it's, so a friend of mine runs Huddle, and they, they've just released a, a, a new new version of their app, and I think that's that's very popular. But um, I mean, if if you're very much enterprise, and then you can sell to a, you know you can get distribution with a big company that you know all of them own 
Blackberries, all of them own iPhones, all of them own whatever. I think that you know that makes life easier from the point of the platform support. But a lot of the time, you run into this, all the same problems now, in that that with lo you know, many more freedoms within the workplace to choose your own devices and teleworking, all this stuff. Then, you know, for a startup, it's it's problematic because if someone's paying for a service, they demand much better. You know, they demand service agreements and all these sort of things. Um, so you, the upside is you get revenue, but um, the downside is you probably have to support more than one platform, and you know then you have the Q and A problems. And you know, from my experience, business customers aren't as forgiving as consumers. So in terms of oh, sorry, you know, Twitter's down again; it's not working. Oops, you know, it doesn't really work in enterprise. Yeah. Um, I think there are some use cases that enterprise uh, mobility has, you know, good opportunity, but most of them are still in the messaging or or email or communication space uh, as all the other ones are kind of like just a boardroom toys to show that oh you you can see your your uh, business intelligence uh, flip chart or the pie chart on your mobile but uh, those are mo mostly toys but most of the functionality in our enterprise i believe is still on the messaging and email i mean for example the uh, hospital messaging systems or uh, or like I mean, BlackBerry success is also due to a very convenient uh, messaging uh, platform. I mean, I've seen some quite cool stuff. Like, I saw a company a few months back that was doing um, specialist uh, data delivery um, and visualizations for um, uh, geologists who at, were at well sites for, for drilling and, and when, they're, when they're surveying sites. And because of this stuff's quite computationally intensive, you know, it was connecting through to the servers and then pulling that information down, you know, optimized for mobile devices and those sort of things, rather than sort of trying to lug a laptop around and then having the problem of connectivity and all this stuff. So I think there are, there are, there are quite a lot of specialist areas out there that it's being used for. Yeah, I would say like a, a problem that you run into is like a, a lot of companies, you know, try to just port their web service or their desktop service to mobile and think it's going to work. I mean, it, you know, when, when the pain point revolves around having, you know, some sort of enterprise need away from a desktop, then it's really easy to solve that with, uh, you know, with a mobile app, like uh, Square, I think is a good example. I mean, like, that's the pain point. It's not that you can't accept payments, but it's, you can't accept payments, uh, you know, a, a small retailer that doesn't have a Visa terminal or whatever, um, you know, selling T-shirts at a rock concert or whatever. That was the pain point. They solved that with a mobile app that wouldn't work on a desktop, because if you have a desktop, then you could probably just get a terminal. Yeah. All right, I think we might have time for one more question if we... Yes, yes, we have about five minutes. We have uh, four minutes and 12 One seconds. very long question. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions? Or we can end five minutes early. It's up to you. I will add a co there is a question, but I will, question add, a in the back. I right. will add a comment to the last topic. There is actually a demo booth of a small startup called CME. I think they are one of these cases where the, where the mobile aspect is really strong because it's, it's a smartphone-based fleet management system. So there is some kind of back end, but the mobile is first. Yes. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Sven. I'm one of the co-founders of Mobile Monday Estonia. So good to have you here. The question I have, uh, Andrew, or maybe others, Andrew, you mentioned that you have three down, one exit. And everybody kind of talks about success cases. I was wondering, maybe you can emphasize a little bit more on what happened, what to look for, where are the warning signs, so on. So you ask about... Like uh, running, running a business, uh, writing a mobile application. So, I mean, what was your experience? Actually, what happened with your okay. Why bad, did I screw bad it cases? Up? Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what you're asking. Um, so, specifically, what are, what are the specific challenges? Um, definitely choose uh, one platform to develop on, like I said. Um, I think talking to a, a lot of these things are uh, very similar to building an online app as well. A lot of them are crossover. Very similar. So, um, talking to your users, and I mean literally talking to your users. You know, reaching out to your users, picking up the phone, trying to meet with them. You know, it, it's something that a lot of European startups I don't think are very good at. They sort of sit and they want to code and build this amazing thing, but don't actually find out why their users stopped using the service. Why do their users carry on using the service? You know, why have they got five users out of a hundred that seem to continue to use it, where ninety-five didn't want to? You know, so really engaging with users. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, um, go-to-market strategy, especially having a very clear message. So when you're talking to someone, you can explain to someone what the value is to them of using your app or your website in under 30 seconds. And again, most entrepreneurs I meet can't do that. They can't tell me, you know, they can tell me what it is, they can't tell me why I should walk out the door and go and use it. Um, 
So I think that's hugely valuable as well. Um, you know, you've, you've got other things to add. No, no, no success, no failure yet. <laughs> working, working on the success side. On the mobile side. He's I mean, working I, hard on the success side. <laughs> I think, I think uh, consu direct to consumer in Europe is a lot tougher than North America. So you know, think very carefully about doing a direct to consumer play if that's what you're, you're thinking about. For, it's harder for all sorts of reasons. The VC's um, risk profile here is not as adventurous as that in the US for investing in consumer, direct to consumer. Um, it, especially if there isn't a revenue stream, if there is a revenue stream, that's much better. But you know, if you've got some crazy idea like Twitter or something else, which is going to make loads of money eventually, then you know that's going to be challenging to raise money. Um, and I think also, you know, you have all the challenges of not having uh, a critical mass of, of early adopters like you do in you know the West Coast, for example. So, you know, most of my other companies were in London, and it's great because you've got lots of smartphone users. But actually getting them to do something on their smartphones because they're so busy with their lives is, is much more challenging than if you're in San Francisco where you have you know, half a million people and they're just obsessed with tech startups and smartphones. That's all they do. You know, that's their thing. So, um, all right. Wonderful. I actually have one question to you, Suros, okay. as well, because you're always asking the questions. I, I did the same thing in the last panel. So you're a tech journalist. Yes. Um, did you know anything about Estonia 10 years ago, or Baltics in general? Did you know anything? 10 years ago? No. Yes. You didn't know I anything. knew two facts about Estonia 10 years ago. Okay. This is 100% this is true. Uh, I knew that Estonia had been occupied by the Soviet Union, okay. and I knew that Estonia was in the northeast corner of Europe. That is all. That okay. Literally nothing else 10 years ago. And, and, and when did you be, become aware of Baltic states and, and, and this area here? Uh, when I first read in an American newspaper that Estonia had declared internet access as a human right in like 2004, 2005 was when I read that. That was the first time, literally, I had ever like thought about Estonia. <laughs> okay, and I, I haven't just... stopped thinking about it since, so. That was amazing. Uh, I, came, I came here like 10 years ago for, for, for a new year, for a weekend, um, and try not to get killed by fireworks in your square in the, in the center of town, <laughs> um, which was insane. Uh, but I was amazed because I walked around and then there's this like sign on the side of the road going, if you have a Windows laptop, you should do this. If you have an app, I'm like, the fuck, this is insane. <laughs> so yeah, that was amazing. Why, free but public Wi-Fi. What were your expectancies around five years ago uh, from this region? Did you expect that we would become active in a startup scene or some? Was it somehow visible or could you? I mean, it was visible to me because I mean, I was just saying to some of the guys earlier, I, I did seed camp um, in London before Christmas, and I think out of the 20 companies, five were Estonian. So you guys seem to have a completely disproportionate number of entrepreneurs for your tech have entrepreneurs. Have you not seen for the Estonian Mafia hashtag? Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen okay. that. I, I know but, some of the guys as well. So. By the way, you should come back to Yarnibab. It's just a couple of weeks away. It will be way better than the fireworks in the, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in the, in the Christmas time. Um, anyway, thank you for the panelists. It has been a very inspiring panel. Thank you very much.